It's a pleasure having you on the podcast. And I appreciate everything you've done over the years as a Buddhist teacher and as a leader of Buddhist organizations. So thanks very much. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. So you've agreed to talk to us about anxiety and depression today, which you've led classes on topics of great interest <laughs> to a lot of people today, obviously. I wonder if we could start out talking about anxiety and what it is from a Buddhist perspective. Yes. And you know, when you really read about mind and mental factors, Tibetans don't necessarily define clearly anxiety and depression. They don't exactly have those kind of experiences, but both of those experiences, but we'll first talk about anxiety, have a great sitting in the false concept we have of ourselves. This inflated, exaggerated notion we have of ourselves what we might call the I, the letter I, and that me, myself, and I, or I, me, and mine experience is so important in Western culture, and not just Western culture, throughout the world. It's amazing how it's the source of all of our suffering. And this fundamental ignorance that it's based in, what I would call a misknowing, K-N-O-W, we misknow. We misunderstand, but we really misknow something. And it's how that sense of ourself really exists. And we don't have any balance. So as soon as that eye gets threatened, anxiety comes in. You know, I go out and I buy a belonging or I buy an expensive house or I buy a car. It's an extension of myself. I have a child. It's an extension of myself to a great degree. And anything that threatens that, Anything that interferes with that agenda can be from the very minor irritable anxiety to huge fear consuming people. So I just see it as more of that, that misknowing of how that I really exists. And in Buddhism, we see that misknowing of that false sense of self, a separate, solitary, independent self as the root of all our delusions. Is there something that specifically differentiates anxiety compared to other delusions, fear and craving and so on? I do think they're all rooted in the false, this false holding that we have of the eye, the false appearance of the eye. And I think it's all rooted, but everybody has their own components to it, how they show up based on the propensities in their consciousness, in their mind. Mm -hmm. And so this is a big stretch in Tibetan Buddhism compared to the conventional world. Buddhism talks about everything comes from the mind. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the conventional world, if you're rotating around what I might call Abrahamonic religions and faiths, if you want to take Christianity, Judaism, Islam, they have a God, the creator, separate from you, that in a large sense is creating the experience of the world, mm -hmm. is making decisions whether you live or die, or whether you have a happy life or not. And now, granted, the essence of a lot of those religions is very similar. And it's also about your participation in them to lead what might be called a righteous life. And we would say that is virtuous. It's the same. Mm -hmm. But this notion that everything comes from the mind then is what are you putting into your mind for one? Because Buddhism has a belief in karma. So you have this law of cause and effect. Karma, Sanskrit word that means action, as we know. And the action, it's the movement of your mind. Mm -hmm. movement of the consciousness. So the mind has thoughts, the mind has experiences, and each of them is imprinting in the consciousness is what Buddhism says. So what's hard for us as Westerners is we want proof of that. I want to know how that imprinting process works. But in some ways with karma, you need to have a more highly realized consciousness to fully understand all of its sophisticated qualities and workings. At our levels, we understand some basic characteristics of it, but you have already built some faith in some of the other parts of Buddhism in your Buddhist path. We're not about blind faith, but from those kind of things, I might say, well, it makes more sense of why horrible things happen to good mm -hmm. people. You wonder why do these people suffer and these people don't suffer? So again, we all have our own makeup based on the imprints in our consciousness is what Buddhism says. And as a result, that will turn up different delusions for you. So mm -hmm. 
if you have more imprints in your consciousness of irritation, frustration, and annoyance that has culminated in full-blown anger, unchecked, then you're going to have more imprints of anger in your consciousness. That delusion will be bigger for you. If you're somebody that has imprints of more fear and worry than an anxiety, those imprints are going to be swimming in more in your consciousness. And sometimes you can actually notice with a young child, this is somebody two, three, four years old. So they really are learning their experience in the world. And maybe they came from the same parents and they have a sibling who's a little older. And somehow you end up with two completely different beings from the same parents, same circumstance. And you see the younger child is full of worry about everything. And there's nothing a two, three, four-year-old really has to worry about raised Mm -hmm. in a relatively peaceful setting, let's say, where there's food, clothing, and shelter. But from a young age, you see them just constantly obsessing and worrying. And so then you have to ask yourself, older child doesn't have it. They don't have that kind of anxiety. Where does it come from? So again, it could just be the propensities in the mind of that individual. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and from a secular perspective too, someone could say you have a genetic predisposition to anxiety, which wouldn't even rule out karma because you could say your genetic predisposition came from a karmic imprint. The thing is you could say genetics, but what happens when you have two kids a year and a half apart from the same parents Yeah, yeah. and the same situation and one suffers from anxiety and the other one doesn't? Is it genetic yeah. then? Maybe the two parents don't have anxiety. Then where does it come from? Because I've seen that at times where the child has some traits of the parents and some behavioral traits, but some traits, not at all like that. Oh, yeah, it's amazing. We have a daughter and it's trickier when you have one child because you can tend to blame the problems more on yourself as a parent. But I think as soon as you have two kids, (laughs) you relax a little more because you see how different they are and how they just had certain propensities. But then the other thing about karma or you know mental conditioning is that the more we reinforce that, the more we retread that thought, the more the groove gets into our mind, which is also reinforced by neuroscience, right? Dr. Rick Hansen says neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> so every time you reinforce a thought of anxiety, fear, it makes that habit a little bit deeper. In That's your mind, right. right. That's right. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely like that. So I have a question for you because Tara Brock actually is a great example who talks a lot about disturbing emotions and she's very gentle because she says that the emotions are telling you something. So I wonder, you know, when we're feeling anxiety, how much of it is a problem to be solved and how much of it is telling us something? Is there something like beneath that strong feeling that we need to listen to in some way? Absolutely. Great, a great point. There's something about, I've read some books on the beginning of man, mankind, and different (laughs) things. And so there is something psychologists are noting now from the different things I've read where when we were in kind of uh, prehistoric days and there were these incredibly large animals moving around and you're living in a cave and you don't have a lot of protection necessarily. So you're going to have a heightened level of awareness with anxiety to protect yourself that's built in. If you're going out and hunting and gathering and working outside with a fire and living in a very simple kind of experience, and there's many, many things out there that can kill you and eat you. And the way animals are now on the planet, and you'll see a wild animal, the way they eat sometimes always looking around. Mm -hmm. So part of it's a built in instinct, primordial instinct, I'd say, to survive, to protect ourselves. So that level is just there. And I find it more helpful to note that, to understand that in dealing with depression and anxiety, especially anxiety, to know that there is going to be an edge. And part of the edge now, if you want to fast forward to modern days, keeps us competitive. It also keeps us aware and conscious I think if we're really wired in the right way, it keeps us compassionate to have an alert system. When you see somebody else troubled, you see somebody else struggling, can we move that primordial anxiety to survive into a compassionate mode to say, oh my goodness, I have to help this person. I am connected to them from primordial days 
but also due to just our general interdependence, I must help them. And that's what I love about Buddhism and really those finer qualities of all the religions is about helping your neighbor and mm. realizing they're not unlike myself. So I think beginning anxiety help is to realize, yeah, I've got a little bit of that to keep the edge because sometimes I'm walking down the wrong street in the city at the wrong time of night and I, I need the protection. I need to be alert and notice. And because I'm wired in that from primordial days, that hopefully will trigger. It doesn't trigger in everyone, but that's there. So let me use it in a skillful way, get myself to a better street with more lights, whatever. And yet when it counters too far and you go home and you're safe and you're still completely apoplectic about, I can't believe I was on that street, you know, then it has to be countered with some more positive analysis. Yeah. So there's a healthy level of self-preservation and that would naturally dial up or down depending on the genuine danger of your situation. But when that becomes too high or mistuned or even present when there's nothing to worry about, you know, like you said, back home or about something else, that's when it becomes more of a, a psychological problem. Sure. So from the Buddhist perspective, then what are the techniques that help us move out of anxiety? What I wanted to say in general of how Buddhism would deal with it, and if we're just dealing with anxiety right now, first of all, is we have to analyze. And obviously, one of the best things would be to analyze that sense of yourself, the overinflated, the gripping onto me, things like that. So meditation on emptiness, obviously, is a solution to nearly everything. And again, of the 84,000 discourses the Buddha gave, all of it was to drive us into emptiness, to get us to understand the nature of reality. So obviously, that's how important it is. What does it actually mean? It's very obscure for a lot of people. They hear about it, but it's very mystical. It's really quite basic on one level once you start studying it, but you do need classroom hours on it with an authentic teacher that knows what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. Then you need to effectively learn how to meditate on emptiness. And it's really helpful if you can do some longer retreats, either once you're settled on your own, to be able to feel, to get more into that meditative space. And you actually need a fair amount of that every day as much as you can. And then when you're not in formal retreat, when you're not in meditation or studying or reading books about emptiness, you're poking reality as you're going through everyday life. You're questioning how things exist when you can. But the thing is, the more your mind is soaked in that perspective that I may be misknowing this particular colleague I don't like, I may be misknowing the story, I have an inaccurate story I started about them, or whatever you're encountering, the more you're questioning and analyzing that from all of the background and emptiness, I think the more helpful to rebalance our mind out of anxiety and depression. If that's challenging for people, which it can be, let's review just a few basics. Basic mindfulness or self-awareness can help with anxiety. And what I mean by that is you begin to watch the arisal of the emotion in your mind. And mindfulness is a really big, hot topic right now on the planet. And many people are very drawn to that type of practice, which is great. I don't necessarily call it Dharma unless you're countering delusions in your mind. Like just to be mindful of my anger is one thing, but if I'm not doing anything and then acting out, it's not that helpful. But here's how mindfulness or self-awareness I find can be really beneficial, is I'm watching the anxiety come in. Then what I have to do is I'm just exploring and noticing that happening. There it is. Can you transport that into bubbles of anxious thoughts? So bubbles have no weight. Can we just let them fly off? Watch them fly off. I might notice a bigger bubble, bigger anxiety, but I'm going to practice over and over and over letting them fly. What happens with normal anxiety, worry, fear, is they're not light, those thoughts at all. Mm -hmm. I then grab a hold of it. I start ruminating over and over the thought. So now I've dug a very deep trench of anxiety, fear, worry in my mind. Okay, it's not constructive. And what happens is because that's a deep trench, it becomes a pattern. 
a deeper habit in the mind. So as soon as a certain trigger happens, I go right into the trench. And I hear people say, they'll say about themselves, I'm an anxious person. I'm a really fearful person. So here's the second thing. Can you just remind yourself of the nature of the mind? Mm -hmm. I'd even say if you're starting with, I'm a fearful person, okay? Let's de-identify with the emotion. De-identify. So instead of, I'm a fearful person, I'm a really anxious person, I just have a lot of anxiety in my mind at times. So it's a very different approach. Is I just, right now I'm having, I'm noticing a lot of worry in my mind. I'm okay, but sometimes I have a lot of worry in my mind. So it's very different when you de-identify with the emotion. But just to go back to mindfulness for a second, with mindfulness, what I'm doing is I'm noting fear, anxiety in my mind as I can catch it. I know that that's already one of my predispositions, you might say. And simply, I'm inhaling, I'm uncomfortable, I'm exhaling, I'm uncomfortable. You might need another breath in, another, maybe deepen your respiration. And maybe you can actually start working with every time you exhale, right? Letting go of some of the fear and anxiety. Maybe imagine it flowing out of you in different colored light rays that represent different images. And maybe as I inhale now, I'm bringing in positive qualities of mind. So there's different exercises you can do just using your breath and trying to dismantle a little bit, disengage the unhealthy thinking. And it does take effort. It does take effort. So those are a couple initial things, I'd say, just to lightly start that process. You also talked about anxiety as a bridge to compassion. Is that something you can do in the moment as you're experiencing anxiety, the way you talked about I'm using mindfulness? So I would say the more, and this is very much from Lama Zopa Rinpoche mm -hmm. as well, the more you can think of others, it's very hard to stay rooted in a lot of those delusions, especially depression, the more you can think of others. And so here's another thing that happens with delusions, especially depression and anxiety. You're experiencing this wave of emotion. And then sometimes thoughts follow of, I'm the only one who feels this way. I'm the only one going through this, which is simply not accurate. Again, because I'm the only one going through it, it comes from the imbalance of the I, again, the imbalance of myself, holding myself to be more important. So if I can start just interjecting some thoughts, it takes a little time to exercise them, is other people experience this as well. I'm not the only one. And I would bring in something I use a lot in self-compassion courses, the concept of shared humanity, our common humanity. We're all on this planet together to think you're the only one experiencing depression or anxiety. So then again, if I could use a basic Tong Lin practice using my breathing, Tong Lin, giving and taking, very profound meditation, okay? But what I first want to do is take, if I can imagine the people on the planet also experiencing anxiety or depression, and you can just be sitting in your living room, and I'm going to inhale right now all that fear and anxiety and depression from them. Okay? I'm not going to take it into myself, but at my core here at my heart, okay, imagine a constricted knot of that, what I'm going to call self-cherishing, which is all your self-absorption, all that focus on the self. And that's another source of our problems. Okay. It's another thing that makes us unhappy. So I'm going to drive all of that anxiety from other people, depression, onto that self-cherishing and minimize that, just purify that. Because that also keeps me from connecting to others. It keeps me rooted in my negative rumination. Okay. And then maybe as I exhale, giving, because I'm minimizing, purifying this self-cherishing, I come out to more spaciousness. So then let me offer that to all these beings with fear, anxiety, depression, 
like that as much as I can. So it, just that thought to start to imprint that thought in your mind of giving and taking, giving hope, happiness, positivity, taking fear, negativity, you know, slowly, if that's all you can do as a spiritual practitioner in this life, yet you're very patterned to do it, fantastic mind space to think of taking others suffering, giving them happiness. So I find that can be quite helpful to think about our common, our shared humanity, that we're not the only ones going through this as well. You brought up depression. Can you talk mm -hmm. about what depression is? from a Buddhist perspective? Yes, yeah, so depression also, not having a really formal definition in, in Tibetan Buddhism, but is once again, because of the mistaken notion of how I exist, it can be at a time of too much thinking about the self in a negative way, thinking of all of my negative qualities and all of the negative circumstances that has ever happened to me. And I stay there, rooted in that. Hopelessness, despair comes from, it's all related to this. So now the other thing, again, that we have to remember karma. And the reason is because you may have past moments in your consciousness. So rather than getting anchored into the depression and deepening that depression, again, creating that deeper trench again, is acknowledging that this is just my karmic makeup. We all come in, like I said, some people come in with extreme anger. Some people come in with a heart of bodhicitta, of this incredible compassion for others. Some people come in with a tremendous amount of fear and anxiety. So for some people, it's depression. And people that do suffer from long-term chronic depression, it's quite serious because they never have a context of that's how their mind is. They end up on medication, which sometimes I think can ease a little bit of the depression as long as you have a mindset that you're not going to be on medication for the rest of your life if it's possible because mm -hmm. there are ways to fix depression and anxiety in our minds tibetan buddhism says absolutely mm -hmm. totally fixable but again just acknowledging the previous imprints that happen to just be showing up in this life for various reasons because karma is very sophisticated and as a result here I am with the depression. And is there a point where depression does become physiological? Or is there a point where this meditation isn't enough? I do think with some people, it does manifest in as physiological, depression and anxiety. I think there's no question. And, and even physiologic, I'd even say environmentally. If you were living in Ukraine now and bombs are falling around you, your anxiety level is going to go way up. And the thing is, you may come out of that. And let's say you're a child. Let's say you escape Ukraine, you end up in a very safe country, and you have every positive thing happen for you, but when loud noises go off, it may trigger post-traumatic stress disorder for you, and suddenly you're anxious from somebody popping a balloon nearby. So you can understand there's environmental reasons as well, physiologically, possibly as well. So that's why I'd find if some people are under a doctor's care, and they're working with a therapist as well, but they want to try some medication to see if it alleviates the pattern of depression. It could be helpful provided they want to use some other tools to eventually move through the depression and get off of the medication if they can, because a lot of those medications have strong side effects. One of the biggest things that we do in our tradition is we do purification practices. And so these practices are quite effective. There's a variety of them. You can do, depending on your makeup, what you're interested in, what your teacher may advise you to do. And I would say from my own experience in just working through a number of these practices on a longer term basis, I've really seen shifts in my mind for the better. Not necessarily related, let's say, to depression and anxiety, but certain other habits I may have wanted to change. And it is quite significant. The thing is, it does take effort. and Westerners, we have no trouble, especially in the States, of making effort. We just tend to make effort in the wrong directions. If we could invest some of our busyness and our work ethic and things into a stronger, consistent spiritual practice that may really have some of these components, I think it can be incredibly powerful for people, for their minds, of changing some of these patterns. And are the antidotes different for depression 
than anxiety in meditation or is it the same? They're somewhat similar, but here's a couple if I want to go into specifics. And one thing I did want to say in general for both of those experiences, I mentioned mindfulness or self-awareness. So the same could be applied to depression. You know, I'm breathing in, I'm feeling depressed. I'm breathing out, I'm feeling depressed. Now what mindfulness does in that context is it simply keeps you there in the discomfort, okay? It's not about making you more uncomfortable. You're already uncomfortable because of the emotion. And yet just staying there with it actually starts changing the discomfort a bit. What happens for most Westerners is we want out of discomfort immediately. Get it gone. I don't want this. Take it away. And But the thing is, a lot of my spiritual practice is actually showing up sometimes for the discomfort, analyzing it. Then it starts dissolving. Okay. And I find then I'm more comfortable. So it's really about getting more comfortable with your discomfort. So another thing that's helpful in also dealing with depression and anxiety, just a little bit more generally first, is if we remember the nature of the mind, remembering the nature of the mind. So in Tibetan Buddhism, we see the mind has two characteristics, believe it or not clarity and awareness. Clarity fools a lot of people. We feel normally that our minds are busy and cluttered and full of stuff. So if you can remind yourself that's not the real nature of your mind, it's actually clarity, that there's a clear space of awareness, that basically the mental issues of depression anxiety like that. They're simply impermanent situations like clouds coming through the consciousness, like clouds in the sky. Okay. These experiences appear, disappear. They come and go. They're not permanent. They're not fixed entities. Okay. So if I can remind myself the clear nature of the mind is there beneath all of those delusions arising, that can also be helpful. And that ability to de-identify. So then instead of me being a depressed person, I just right now have a lot of depression in my mind. If it's a chronic situation of depression ongoing like that. So that can be helpful. One last general antidote, I would say before getting into more specifics is being non-judgmental, meaning that you may notice at certain times, certain thoughts and emotions that arise, depression, anxiety, okay? And you don't like those. So you label a very heavy self-criticism about it. I shouldn't be thinking this. I'm horrible to have this in my mind. Like I'm a depressed person. But instead, when you see your mind caught up, what about cultivating a sense of equanimity? So this is an equal regard with each of these experiences that arises, okay? And creating a more loving awareness, a more acceptance of whatever is arising in your mind, okay? Because we are human, we make mistakes at times and we'll have less than generous thoughts about ourselves and others. It's normal, it's normal. For those people that are depressed, they're gonna have more depressive, self-critical thoughts in their mind, just the way it works. If you're anxious, you're going to have more of those thoughts in your mind, creating more anxiety. So again, just by observing, using the mindfulness initially, okay, there's a depressed thought. There's a lot of depression. Reminding yourself of the nature of the mind. Mind is clear. Depression is not my mind. It's not innate with my mind. Okay. And I'm just experiencing this right now from previous moments of this in my mind. I'm okay. If somebody else, if a good friend of mine was experiencing this and feeling this, I would be very gentle, compassionate with them. So why not with myself, with that place, again, loving awareness and acceptance as much as possible. And then moving into some more specific antidotes is what Tibetan Buddhism asks. So again, we have a couple main kinds of meditation we do in Tibetan Buddhism. The standard one most people associate with meditation is placement or stabilizing meditation. Shine in Tibetan, 
calm abiding, basically. Shamatha in Sanskrit. So this is where we're placing our mind on something and keeping it there stably. And that's what most people think of as meditation. But we have a second type of meditation called analytical meditation, where we are analyzing something to come to a deeper insight. So you need to examine in the face of depression what your mind is saying. And you want to try to begin to correct whatever is not realistic. So for instance, you're going to have with depression negative, repetitive, self-critical thoughts. I'm worthless. I don't deserve to be loved. Nobody likes me. I never do anything right. And if you want to be honest with yourself, look at these thoughts. They're not entirely accurate. So you want to change the recording in a sense. And sometimes I visualize myself years ago having some negative self-speak And I pictured myself with my finger on the button of the recorder. Oh, you're playing that recording again? Aren't you tired of that? And so eventually, and this was in the old days where we had cassette tapes or micro cassette tapes, is I started pushing a different recording button, letting a different recording play of more positive, realistic thoughts. And eventually I could just throw the tape out, visualize myself just getting rid of that entirely. But it takes time. We have to make that effort to realize that it's two steps forward, one step back, spiritual practice. So I'm going to make some headway, but then I'm going to fall down again and notice the negative self-critical speak come up. It's very normal. But again, working on cultivating this acceptance, self-compassion, perfectly great part of the path to do as I examine what the mind is actually saying. The second thing I wanted to mention is something I call thought interruption and thought replacement. Thought interruption, you may visualize actually throwing a wrench into cogs that you're visualizing and actually saying to yourself, stop thinking. When the negative rumination starts, the depressive thoughts, just stop thinking. Or when the panic comes, the the worried thoughts. And then what you want to do is you've interrupted, stop thinking, right? But you need something to replace the thoughts with, something joyful, something you feel joyful about. Best to put it into your own imagery. So for instance, I have a friend that suffers from a great deal of chronic depression. And her image is she's in a small room filled with puppy dogs. So that works for her and that makes her happy, but she has to consciously bring it to mind and keep herself there at times of the day when she can visualize that. I mean, sometimes she can't visualize it in the middle of a business meeting, but she will make time during the day to interrupt the other negative self-speak with this. So come up with your own image, whether it's you're lying on a beautiful beach, whatever your happy place is over and over bringing this in a little bit more readily, whether it's just visualizing a beautiful flower vase that happens to pick you up in the middle of a business meeting or something. Using that imagery, so you're interrupting, it's stopping the negative speak and then replacing it with something that uplifts the mind. On a more traditional level, we might meditate on appreciating the positive circumstances of your life appreciating your positive qualities. This is something I wake up with the first couple minutes of my day is that wave of appreciation soaking through body and mind. So you talked about how to create a kind of happy place in your mind. You're calling it thought interruption. And you also talked about cultivating positive thoughts about yourself too. Now this may sound silly or not, But for a person who's having trouble thinking of positive thoughts about themselves, could you give some examples of that? (laughs) So how to cultivate that thought if you're not feeling that way? Yeah. Yeah. So if you're thinking so much about your negative qualities, negative problems, just for anybody listening out there, some very concrete examples of positive ways to think about yourself. I know it may sound silly, but... No, it could be, have you ever treated someone to a meal? Mm -hmm. Have you ever been a caring friend where you made time to listen to a friend who's struggling? Have you been a pretty good daughter or son? 
where you've showed up for your parents. Did you ever buy your parents a, a birthday present once in a while? And it can be small things. Like you, you might, what depression wants to do is say, well, I miss that one birthday with my mother and it's going to hold on to that. What about all the other times you sent a card or you called? Mm-hmm. Why not focus on that? So what we need to do is give equal airtime. And depression doesn't want to do that. Depression only wants to focus on the negative. So you have to balance. So if you have a negative thought about yourself, find the other side of the scale, then you've got to counter with a positive. And I would ask people that really suffer from depression, every negative thought you have about yourself, I missed my mother's birthday the last five years, then you've got to counter with two. But I sent her a card then, and I sent her chocolates on that thing, and I sent her a card on Valentine's Day. So you've got to have a couple things like that. So again, a simple thing, Did you have you ever bought anybody flowers? Have you stopped at a four-way stop sign? Okay, and I'm, I'm not kidding, because driving with Lama Zopa Rinpoche across San Francisco many years ago, San Francisco is a city filled with four-way stop signs, if you haven't noticed. And so what was happening is we were late for the program across the town that we had rented a large church. This is when I was living at Sachin Ling Center. And I'm driving Rimshay alone, and I'm getting more and more irritated at the four-way stop signs as we're traversing town. And many of the stop signs, there'd be four people pulling up at each corner. And then you're waiting, and it's supposed to be the person on the right goes first, but we're all on the right of somebody. So everybody's waiting. We're late. And obviously, Rinpoche, I felt, knowing my mind, we stop at the next stop sign. And what does Rinpoche say? Right? I don't say anything. I'm not saying I'm irritated and I'm angry. Rinpoche says, it's so kind how everyone stops at the stop sign. So kind. So immediately cutting my irritated mind, just thinking of me, we need to get across town. We're late. Me, me, me. Instead, like there's basic kindness like that. The fact that you stop at a red light or a stop sign, of course you do it because you don't want to get hit yourself. But there's an order to the planet, you know, that when you go to the grocery store, you line up behind the last person in line. It's just, I think that's kind. Maybe you look around a little bit and let somebody go that just has the one jar of mayonnaise. So there's many things you can focus about yourself, but you have to consciously do it if you're finding that what you're rooted in is the negative self-speak they bring to mind. Yeah. I think that's really helpful. And just to bring it home, the idea that you directly counter the negative thought about yourself. And your suggestion is to think of something related. If it's, I didn't send my mom a birthday card, then you think I did last year and the year before and for 30 years before that. So I think that, thank you for all those practical examples. I love the one that stop sign. I'd never heard that before. And, and sadly, I actually have a friend whose son was just injured in a stop sign accident. Mm. So you're literally saving someone's life every time, <laughs> potentially saving someone's life every time you stop at a stop sign. So it's a very right. beautiful thought. And it's simple, those things. You know, it's a simple thing. You never think about it. But there's so many simple, wonderful little treasures. Every day we go out and do something. But again, the minds of anxiety and depression want to keep you rooted in a fearful, dark, I don't even want to say dark, but a kind of negative experience. So again, it's going to take some effort, but we all have stuff we're working on. You're just like all of us. You're not any more special. The depression wants to hold you as more special because you're chronically depressed. That's just Mm -hmm. a device of the negative parts of your ego. Yeah. Yeah. So this is all good advice to us as an individual if we're depressed or even if we're having self-critical thoughts. When you go to tell a depressed person, hey, (laughs) cheer up, think positive, that doesn't always go so well. So as a non-depressed person, friend of a depressed person, what can we do? What is, what's a skillful way to approach being a good friend? It's not helpful to say to somebody like, oh, just feel better. And so people that have never been depressed, it's very hard to really understand the sinking in the mind and how the mind loves to take a hold of itself and stay there. So again, we've got the self-cherishing going on, self-grasping. And so basically try to get them to analyze. And I'll give you an example. The first thing is empathy. I'm so, so sorry you're experiencing this. I'm so sorry it's been going on for so long. And what I would do is, can you tell me what it feels like? Really get in there with the person. So again, empathy different than pity. Pity is I'm standing up here 
on the outside of the trench, looking down at you in the trench of depression. And I don't really want to get my hands dirty. So I go, oh, I'm so sorry. And then pity might say, is there anything I can help you with? But you don't really want to get down there. Empathy is down there in the trench, not meaning you have to experience depression yourself, but simply saying, can you tell me a little bit of how does it manifest for you? Like, how do you feel right now from it? Do you have a color that kind of defines it for you or a feeling? Do you have any triggers that might suddenly pop and make it happen more for you? Do you notice when you're around these people or is it always when it's raining? Do you ever feel depressed when it's sunny? Do you feel depressed here or here where you're living here or here? So I just try to get a little bit better understanding. So they feel heard as well, that somebody is really listening. Because when they realize you're really listening, they're a little bit more receptive for you than second level when you feel they're ready or is to start to have them analyze. Is it accurate? What's your mind telling you when you're in this space? And they might say, oh, I can't do, I don't I never do anything right. I messed up at work. My boss said this project wasn't what they wanted. And I might say, has your boss ever said that there was something positive that you did? Or have you gotten other feedback at work? that there was something positive. And generally there is. Depression may not want to acknowledge it, but there is. Or they might say something personal about their lives and then you remember a positive thing that they've done. So then you can bring up the positive thing. I know you made that mistake, but I remember when you were dealing with that person that was really difficult and then you got them laughing and you made a positive relationship with them. And I was amazed how you did that. It was so skillful. So you're just bringing them. And another thing that was very helpful with a friend of mine who was really chronically depressed for about 40 years was I knew her before the 40 years when she wasn't depressed. And so when she would tell me, it's always been like this, that, and then I reminded her, remember when I visited you and I spent the weekend with you and your parents and we remember we went out and I reminded her of all the fun things we did. And then she was reminding and she was laughing. And then I said, you weren't depressed then. It stopped her in her tracks to remind her the depression was not always in her mind, mm -hmm. which gives you hope that you can actually get past it to return to the mind without depression. That's very helpful. Yeah, thank you. I wanted to return to something you were saying with anxiety. You know, I'm a parent. I know a lot of parents and our kids are quite anxious. I think maybe more kids than on average are anxious Very, right now. Yeah. So as a parent of an anxious child, could you talk a little bit about what we can do to help? It's a great question. And I feel for the younger population that, first of all, the last couple of years have been very bleak and very challenging for a lot of people even the privileged ones, certainly for the, the non-privileged, it's been a nightmare. And younger people seem to be affected about global warming. What's their future going to be like? It's very real. So what I would focus on is, again, a lot of people have said this, so it sounds cliched now, but is it possible to establish limits on their use of their devices? I hate to say it, but sociological studies have been done at universities and colleges in the States, one of them I read about where the kids were off their devices for two weeks. Absolutely no phone, computer, tablet, internet, nothing. And it was a part of a sociology class and they had to chart all kinds of different aspects of their lives from homework, study habits, interpersonal relationships, eating habits, exercise habits, levels of happiness levels of unhappiness, coping mechanisms. It was fascinating. So naturally, as you can understand, after two weeks, the reports came in and they were all doing really well, excelling in every single one of the categories, sleeping better, better health habits, feeling better, better interactions with their families like that. I think they were allowed use of the telephone only, you know, or in person with family members. So again, because it woke them up and things. But as soon as it was over and they were allowed to go back to the devices, the habit is so strong. And also the FOMO, fear of missing out. So immediately they were back on, but some of them were able to limit a little bit. 
also I would highly recommend exercise, getting out into nature, but exploring nature with more awareness, like really pointing out to kids as you're walking with them, oh, look at that flower. Oh, look how the mud here is more this, but oh, it looks like a hoof print of a deer. Like just showing them other stuff that some kids are not going to be overly interested, but if there's a routine that every Saturday at this time I go out for a walk with my parents or we're going to explore something like that, some other type of activity, whether it's even creative where they're painting something, you're painting something together, you're constructing something together, or you're volunteering, that you're taking your kids to volunteer with you. Any way they also get a sense of a bigger purpose in life, of their interconnectedness to all of this reality where they can give back. And they see it through their parents. If the parents are volunteering and take them with them, that this is an important aspect of life is either philanthropy, if you're privileged and wealthy, you don't even need to be that wealthy, but showing them that part of their birthday money, they can donate. I think it really shows them that the source of happiness is from helping others. And it's a key part of their mental well-being. So Mm. the planet is not hopeless. There's many things they can continue to contribute over time, over life. And also trying to drive them into selecting positive vocations of right livelihood where they will glean great meaning for their lives like that. I think it can be helpful for kids. Have them at an early age analyze the anxiety, for instance. Have them go in and say, okay, let's look at what you're really worried about now. And is it reasonable to have this fear? The fear may not be reasonable, but also ask them, what would be reasonable with a good motivation that you could take care of this fear right now? Is there anything you can do about it? So they might say, it's just a fear of that guy in class is going to show up. And so if you're going to be all focused on this person, some more social relationship you want to have, what about your own friends? Are you building a strong social network from your own friends who are always going to be there when the intimate relationships may not? So exploring that with them to make sure that they're grounded and rooted with a good friend basis and social networks like that. And then there may be something where they talk about global warming and you go, okay, what can we do about it? Let's look at how we recycle. Let's look at our vehicle. Let's look at how we use technology. Are we turning off lights? Are we being wasteful with energy on what they can do? And then the bigger thing, if you can't do something, Teach them how to let it go because there's nothing you can do about it. So teach them just breathing meditations. Visualize those thoughts sifting out different colored light rays and visualize you're bringing in hope to empower you to continue to live wisely on the planet, exhaling fear and that kind of ruminating mind. Wow. These are great answers because they're mostly all very deep, long-term ways of cultivating a healthy mind. It does take time and showing them also the patience to work with themselves and their minds. This isn't going to, this doesn't happen overnight that everything changes and they feel better. It's a process. That's wonderful. Is there anything else you'd like to add about anxiety and depression? One thing I would add is, I talk about this a lot in classes, is especially earlier in life, if possible, but you can do it at any time, is to understand what lights you up inside. So this is about finding deeper meaning in life. It's very, very important. And what I mean is it's not superficial happiness. Years ago, and I give an example, is years ago I had an idea that a beach holiday was really fun. And that's what I really want to do long term. And so I would save money, save up my holiday time. This is long before the Dharma. And then I get time on the beach, go with my friends, rent a house for a week, whatever. It was delightful. There was many wonderful things about it. But sometimes after seven days, eight, there was like I'd read a lot of books. If it went on too long, it could get boring. There was an aspect of, for me at least, that, is this it? Like, this is, okay, you have the beach holiday. Are you really deeply happy here? If it went on for longer and longer, because something that brings you lasting happiness 
means the longer you'd have it, the happier you'd get. But the beach holiday, and I actually one time checked and had a longer holiday, and I was like, this isn't it. This is great, but this is not it. And then years later, I was running Vajrapani Institute. We were hosting a very big retreat with about 80 people for a month. Lama Zopar Rinpoche was in attendance. And I noticed about two weeks into the retreat, everybody seemed pretty happy. The retreat was going really well. Rinpoche seemed very happy with what was happening. The retreaters seemed very happy. The staff was very happy. I was like, this is fantastic. And people seem to be really getting a lot out of the retreat. So I felt incredibly happy to be able to support this with the staff. And we finished the last session of the retreat one evening, we went out at Vajrapani. There's a big shrine called a stupa. We went out and a few of my very close friends were turning around the stupa before we were going off to our different living spaces. And it was just a beautiful night in the redwoods with the lights out and on the stupa. And it was just beautiful. And I was thinking, I just felt higher than I had ever felt. I was so deeply satisfied and happy and really and I remember making this prayer of may I continue to do more of this may I continue to support these kind of activities or participate in these kind of activities as long as it's beneficial for as many beings as possible and as long as it pleases the minds of my teachers and and I realized that's what really lit me up and so I've really tried to direct my life in that way so I would say to people to please find meaning like that in your life now, which I feel very much involves helping others as much as possible. And don't wait any longer. If you're not clear, find what really lends that support for your happiness, because then you'll really be happy in what you're doing. And it doesn't mean it's perfect. This is samsara, nothing's perfect, but you basically can continue to contribute and participate in that way, I think is really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm, That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So, Venerable Amy, thank you so much for talking to me about anxiety and depression. I really appreciate it. And I think our audience is going to benefit a lot. And for people listening too, if you want to make a donation, I'd encourage people, instead of supporting us, as you hear this message, to send some of your funds to the Land of Medicine Buddha, where Venerable Amy is the chairperson of the board, because they're working on rehabilitating their finances after the COVID era. And we'll have a link to that on our website. And also, if people are interested in, I've cut down a little bit on my teachings, but I have a website, Mm -hmm. amymiller.com, A-M-Y-Miller.com. So if you're interested in coming to some of those programs, which are around the planet via Zoom, sometimes in person, uh, you can check up there like that. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. And we'll share a link. You've led weekend courses on this topic and uh, in other structures. So if you want to go deeper with Venerable Amy, we'll have links to that on our website. And that website is connected to a YouTube channel. So a lot of these programs I've done are recorded and they're categorized by topics. So people can go into Mm -hmm. a certain topic if that's helpful like that. Fantastic. Thank you again. I really appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you.